Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome and the Hamburg University Te of Technology at our, uh, at our future lecture. We have established this format of the future lectures to have uh, something inspiring and something new in our university. And we have the hybrid lecture today, so we have people who are here. We are very glad to see you here and uh, we have also quite a lot uh, on uh, um, online. We have a stream of of, uh, of, this, um, of these talks and we will stream everything including the discussion but then we will put a part of this on the YouTube and our future lecture channel without the discussion so we will put just the lecture so please feel free any questions uh, we are they are going to be forgotten after after we have finished but uh, first of all a uh, very warm welcome from my side my name is Irina Smanova I'm a uh, vice president of research of our university and I'm uh, really glad to present you first um, why we think that this future lecture format help us especially in the research but also in the education what you have here are the research fields of our university we have here five different research fields, and what you see here on the top are the environmental and energy system what uh, I think you know are very important right now then we have logistic mobility and infrastructure cyber physical and medical system where all the digitalization topics also are developing with the new technologies. Then we have our hamburger topics, aviation and maritime system. So with all these activities together with the industry that we have here. And then one of our uh, most, uh, uh, most prominent uh, area in the basic research, these are advanced materials and bioprocesses. And uh, we are very glad that all this area are not competing but they are all working together and uh, they develop the uh, very interesting methods of research and science in engineering but we are Hamburg University of Technology that is why we would like that all this area brings something to our society and we look always on the societal impact of our projects and this is what we want also to highlight with our lectures in the last year our University Board has developed this strategic initiative, Engineering to Face Climate Change, where we would like to address this in the research and te in teaching. And since we are engineers, we are not all only interested in the method how to mitigate the climate change, but we are pragmatic people. We would like to see how to live with those changes which are already there. And that is why the second pillar, managing the climate impacts. And uh, what, how do we want to manage all that we would like to develop the technological solutions which allow us to tackle these two pillars and to develop the technologies who, which allow us to take this challenges and this within this strategic initiative we do hope with we support the young researchers and we do suppose we do hope that we can also educate our students in this field and what we also would like to do is to support the Hamburg climate change uh, to a plan in order to see how the engineering can help here and we really think that this is a time of engineering solution we need to come up and to merge with the reality in not only stay in the science. When you look at our homepage, you will see a lot of news, what we are doing in the, in the research and societal impact. I just put some of you to make, uh, to make you curious to have a look at our homepage. We just uh, uh, have here this climate change in focus. Please have a look if you are interested. And one of these is our future lecture, what do we have today? So what is the purpose of uh, uh, today's lecture? Our future lectures have several aims. First of all, for sure, uh, we want to address the emerging research challenges, which is uh, actually a very natural uh, aim of a university. But at the same time, we would like to, uh, to show how strong we can impact the society and how this innovative research can help us to uh, really to change something in our everyday life. And talking about these two points, we hope to develop really new research ideas which we would like to address in the upcoming years. So that is why today 
uh, we asked for these future lectures uh, to be organized by the research fields and we have today the field of environmental and energy technology and our new research initiative, Climate Informed Engineering, which Professor Shokri will be talking about in a couple of minutes. And they have suggested to organize the lecture within the title which, uh, which you have here, uh, Can a Human Adapt to the climate change. And uh, what we would like to listen to today is a, um, in the input of our external guest, but also to show you what we are doing in our university about these topics. That is why when you come out after the lecture, you will see here several posters presenting our research and that you uh, not get bored during that. You will be supported by our local, local TOHH beer. So please to be generous to our students and they also will will provide a poster about their bio production, uh, bio, uh, bio production, which is a chemical engineering and food engineering at the same time, and also some brezel for you. So, um, uh, but we have to listen first, and uh, that is why we are looking forward very much to our first uh, speaker, who is uh, Professor Kaveh Madani. He is the head of the research program in the United Nations University, and we are very proud to have this guest here. He was invited by Professor Shokri, uh, our uh, pro uh, new professor who is very active in all our research programs, and Professor Madani will address this very interesting uh, uh, topic today. And after his talk, we will have a short panel discussion, and we have two more guests here. We have uh, Dr. Heiko Knopf, who is uh, coming from Berlin to us, and he is uh, uh, he, he's in the board of the Green Party of our Bundesrepublik Deutschland, and um, we have also Professor Stevens here. He is the managing director of Max Planck Universe, uh, Institute for Meteorological, and he is uh, working with the climate model already for many years. So uh, we are have an interesting program in front of us to introduce you our first uh, first speaker, uh, Professor Madani is also educated and have a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the University of California, and he has a very international career. He has been to U.S. with the different stations, as you see. He has also have been to the Imperial College in London. He has published over 300 uh, publications and have given a number of the keynote speeches here, and it is interesting that he's one of the six scientists featured by Reuters on the climate hot list, and also one of the top 10 climate change scientists being followed on Twitter, <laughs> which is also important in, in our time. And he has so many prizes that they did not uh, suit in this one slide. So just uh, I have uh, put here some most important station. And within this introduction, I, uh, I would like now to uh, ask Professor Madani to come to the stage. And I wish all of us a very interesting evening, a very interesting lecture that we learn something, but then we will discuss with each other. The discussion will be a common discussion in the panel. So we will have first the speech of Professor Madani, then short introduction of climate and fault engineering by Professor Shokri, and then the short speech of uh, Dr. Knopf, and then the all speakers are going to ask you questions from their point of view, and I think that will be an interesting discussion for us. So please, Professor Madani, we are looking forward for you too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. So it's a true pleasure to be here. Thanks for the kind intro and, and, and thanks for the invitation. Um, and Congratulations on, on all the achievements. I just, we just got a tour of, a little bit of a tour of um, what is happening here. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite impressive how different uh, components of research are c contributing um, to our fight for, for survival and, and for staying sustainable. And, and that is um, great. So today's talk is, um, uh, is not a technical talk in a sense. It is more of a food for thought. Um, to, to 
uh, get us think about um, what we can all do as, as proud engineers and, and scientists who um, want to use our science and knowledge uh, for action, for having a real impact on the real world. And, and our contribution is, is very much needed uh, today. Uh, so um, let me start by asking you, um, uh, you know, this, this debate about um, climate change keeps coming back. We have um, different generations with different attitudes toward um, climate change. We were just talking about um, some, some stuff happening um, today in, in another city in, in, in Germany. Um, you know, the reactions of protest, like climate protesters, let's say, um, who believe that in, in, in a few decades we won't exist. And we have others in another camp who think that we as humans have survived um, forever, uh, you know, as long as we have existed and we have gone through different, one crisis after another, and this will, you know, we will manage this one perfectly as well. So to start, let me ask you, uh, which camp you belong to? Uh, do you think humans can adapt to climate change? If yes, raise your hand, please. Thank you. And, and if you don't, don't think we can survive and adapt to climate change, please raise your hand. Okay. Now, another question to ask is whether, if you think we can manage uh, this crisis and survive, do you think uh, the pressure on all of us as humans around the world would be equal? Or can we all survive together? Or again, the better citizens of the world are the ones who bear the less pressure. Now, is this going to be a fair and just um, game and crisis or not? Uh, if you think um, it is a just game and all of us would have the same, you know, to have to deal with the same problems, raise your hand. If you don't think that's the case, raise your hand. <laughs> I think it is not a, you know, a just game. And as a person who, who comes from the developing world and the global south, I, you know, I like you. I like to remind you that we have more responsibility on this side of the planet in the global north to think about um, what's happening to the rest of the world. As we saw in the you know, COVID-19 crisis, the pressure on different nations would not be equal. And, and the exchanges, friendship, partnership, and all of those are the ones which, which can um, help um, and are necessary to, to help us survive. With that, I also want to, as an Iranian, you know, um, um, I, I like to thank the, you know, your university and the president uh, for supporting the Iranians, uh, the brave Iranian students who are uh, fighting for their fundamental human rights. I saw a statement by the university, and I'm thankful to you on behalf of all those who are um, um, doing so in the university students. It means a lot. So these are the moments that we can think about how to to help each other and how to support each other in the fights um, for, for the things, for the equal world. Now, with that, I'm gonna back to go back to this, this question. I think the answer to this question is, is really you know, not clear. It's an uncertain world and we don't know how this would evolve. A few years ago, uh, we were dealing with another crisis and it, you know, the situation was really dark. We didn't take it seriously at the beginning. Going through it, there was like, you know, different reactions, different actions, and all these confusion. And still, we don't know how, you know, uh, what was the best route to deal with the problem. And we are still dealing with the consequences of what we went through. But as we, um, you know, can be um, hopeful at the same time, uh, uh, you know, because of what we have achieved in the past, we also have to be less arrogant and think that, you know, there are failures, there are, you know, a, a, uh, there are times that we have failed. There are civilizations which don't exist anymore because of um, different um, um, natural disasters in the past, and those are the ones we don't hear about. And of course, there are su successful civilizations that um, we have learned about uh, throughout the history. But you know, modern humans um, have gone through um, different industrial revolutions. Uh, the way we live today is, is the result of, of all those contributions that these industrial revolutions have, have made. And now we are in the, you know, some people believe that we are in the midst of the four, fourth industrial revolution, which is um, making a lot of impact on the way we live, on the way we think, on the way we behave, and, 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 and so on. Uh, we have 
an unprecedented capacity to compute, to measure, to, um, to remotely control things, to remotely sense uh, things. Uh, all, the, all the big things you hear about, AI, machine learning, digital twins, all these things which have become possible uh, are because of the, the, the recent improvements we have made. Uh, um, the, this capa the capacity we have to compute didn't exist before. Things are becoming cheaper and cheaper. Things are becoming faster and faster. Our cell phones are right now faster than the computers that we ran our models on to, to get our PhDs. Uh, this, these moments are, are the good moments. We can celebrate what, what what we have achieved together, and these, these improvements make us hopeful that we can figure out things. Uh, we have seen, um, you know, we are seeing different technologies that are coming out that can help us um, address the, the grand development and environmental challenges, the earth challenges, all these, these um, say, different different technologies, different material, different things that we, we, we talk about in engineering and science are, are helpful. The different technologies that we are using to make things smarter and smarter. Our systems are becoming smarter and smarter. Uh, more automation, cheaper cost of, um, of, of running our systems, and, and now we can grow further and further. And of course, we are now smarter than before, hopefully knowing that growth comes with some, some consequences that we need to watch. So, so so, so these, um, the, the smartness is what we have achieved and, and it's, it's what is helping us and making us hopeful about what we can do together, what we can accomplish together despite all the boundaries that we have, the geographical, political boundaries and, and so on. And, and we have learned through, you know, even recent years, imagine that all these technologies didn't exist and we wanted to survive throughout the COVID, you know, this pandemic. If these things didn't exist, survival even through the pandemic would have not been you know, possible at, at this cost, at the cost that we have experienced. And yes, you know, we, we might not readily see the impact this, this revolution has had on the COVID-19 vaccine discovery, but like, you know, it has had impact on the way we lived. We adopted to the pandemic, we, we changed things. We are also continuously um, changing our, our behavior, this industrial revolution, and the knowledge we have gained is, 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 is affecting us. These technologies are affecting the way we behave, the way we, we think about things, the way, I don't know, we, we, we even socialize together. All of these have, have changed. So when we are talking about sustainability, less energy use, this and that and that, all, you know, electric cars, mode of transportation, all of these have been affected or have benefited from from this industrial revolution. But here's also a, a, let's say, a negative side to this. Can we be hopeful and be arrogant? Just because we have made all these improvements, can we, we be sure that we can, we can survive, we can go through this at no cost? And there is no need for us to mitigate. Apparently, um, you know, that's what we are hearing from the scientists, that it's no longer enough to mitigate. We cannot fully mitigate um, the problem, at least that, you know, there is a huge uncertainty associated with all our projections. But we know that, you know, with, with the common sense or co the, the agreement right now is that we, we need to, in, you know, in addition to mitigation, we have to adapt. Now, the question is how adaptable are we, our, our societies, our, our economies, are to the consequences of climate change and other um, environmental, um, I would say, damages of the previous revolutions. Now, let's step back for a moment, think about this you know, fast pace that we are having right now. We're fast, we're furious, we're, we're doing all these calculations. We think we can remotely sense everything and understand everything and measure everything. But that's how people thought, the previous generations in each revolution thought that they have solved the problem. They have the solution. They have the perfect solution. They can, can resolve all the problems they had. And every time we, we thought that way, we created new consequences, unintended consequences of development, unintended consequences of technology and discovery. In our field, in science and technology, we don't have the culture that the medical scientists, medical 
um, you know, doctors have. Um, you remember, we needed COVID-19 vac COVID vaccine badly, but still we had to wait for all the experiments, all the tests, everything to, you know, had to, was expedited. They did it fast, but, but still we had to wait for a long time until the vaccine comes, and the vaccine came with a long list of potential consequences, and still we might not know some of the consequences, but we decided um, to use it. The same doesn't exist necessarily in engineering. We don't produce a technology and, and give it to people and sell it with a long list of potential impacts. Normally, we adopt something, we use it, we sell it, and after a while, then we re realize there are things that we need to deal with. And, and, and then we ask people to conserve, change their habits, and so on. Climate is warming, at least. This is something that we, we agree on, that the temperature around the world has increased uh, gradually, and it continues to do so. That's why we think and believe, we might be wrong, but the science tells us right now that this is an anthropogenic Im impact. You know, it's a, a human-induced uh, problem. And if it is, then we have to think about what to do. Though. We are, we are seeing also that the pollution, the, emission, um, the emissions are continuously increasing and we have not been really successful in capping the emissions. There are economies that are still counting on, on developing further and further. Some people got, you know, they were too fast, including some environmentalists when the COVID-19 hit, they were celebrating the, you know, the blue skies and, and stop on, on development. And then we saw the economic recession after war, then now the nation's trying to catch up and all those problems related to the, you know, Russian invasion um, to Ukraine and the energy crisis in, in, in Europe and all those things that uh, are hurting us um, badly in our fight. To work to with climate change and are in, in, in a fight for, for delivering on the SDG sustainable development goals by 2030s. We're seeing water problems around the world in Germany. Now this is something that I think many Germans are known about. This is no longer the global south problem. Last December I had a chance to uh, share my comments with the UN Secretary General and I, I, I warned him and, and, and you know shared my thought that global water bankruptcy is looming and this problem is becoming more and more unsolvable because we really don't know how to decouple our economies, our agriculture, our you know, farming industries from water. And as long as we, especially the global south, are dependent, the farmers are dependent on, on water availability, the consequences of what is happening is, can be drastic. And it's, it's not only you know, the farmers who are being impacted, we are now seeing cities running out of water, we are seeing wetlands drying up, um, dust storms forming, and in addition, in addition to climate change, and this is extremely important to note because not all of our problems environmental problems or other problems are induced by climate change. Climate change is only one of the byproducts of unsustainable development. And, and you know, the, the fact that we are focusing on it too much is, is also being you know, counter-constructive to an extent. So also we have development and, and anthropogenic impacts, local impacts, changes in the land use, changes in, in, in different things, development plans being implemented, which are combining their impacts with climate change, a global uh, problem, and, and are hurting our, our systems. Food crisis, at least we know it very well after the, the recent war and invasion of um, Ukraine, that, that is a serious problem and, and the poor are getting hurt and even, even the food prices have been affected, impacted in, in the global north. So, so this is another serious problem and, and we are seeing wars. I mean, humans of the 21st century, maybe five years ago, we had no imagination whatsoever about the coming pandemic, about the invasion of another country like in, uh, in, in, in Europe and, and, and then the world watching to an extent, yes, we are condemning it, but we haven't been able to stop it. <clears throat> and then migrations and, and all these people who lose their jobs because of war, conflicts, um, you know, lack of water and so on. And, and then, you know, forced migrations, impacts, conflicts, wars, in, internal crises, like what we have seen in Syria and other parts of the Middle East, demonstrations, this and that, suicides in, 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 in India, like, you know, farmers. So, so these are all the problems that should remind us that, no, the world might not be as beautiful, the path forward might not be as clear as we, we think. And at the same time that we are hopeful and try, we are fighting for, for 
for solving this problem, and that's, that's what we need to do if, if we, we, we lose hope, especially the environmentalists. The environment would be one of the first victims. We, we gotta think about the, the, this, the uncertainty that is associated with, with the system we are dealing with. We don't know what the tipping point is and where the tipping point is, but we, you know, the tipping point might be close. Might, I don't know, and would you say close, we are talking about um, you know, close historically, and I, I come from Iran, so thousands of years of history. So, so we're not talking about two decades from now where we'll be all dead. But we, you know, we're talking about the future of humans. We should care about the next generations. And you know, the, the, the kids who are in this room and are, who come in, have come to this talk and, and, and what's gonna happen to their future and the, the, their future generations and so on. So we don't know what the, where the tipping point is. And that is, that is scary because when we don't know where the tipping point is, we, can't delay, we will delay the problem because we are not taking this risk seriously. Another issue that we have is though that we are dealing with, you know, waiting for all these projections and fights about how warmer the climate would get and how hotter it would be, whether uh, the tipping point would come after 1.5 degrees or like we can still go a little higher. Uh, what are the projections? What's going to happen and by the end of the century in this spot in the world? And, and dedicating so much resources and, and you know, so much of our, our you know, labor to projecting the future and less to enabling the future. I think that's where our, our, you know, our role becomes clear as, as engineers. Projection is good, and we gotta have a picture of what is happening, and understanding, and a rough understanding of what is happening. But there is no way we can get it right. Give me one model, tell me one model in the world developed for COVID-19, projecting the number of patients in the world which fo function well. It gave us accurate numbers. None of them, none of them had enough, le enough level of um, accuracy. But they were good in, in, in forcing us to change our behavior, uh, to force the politicians to take actions at some point. And, and they were guiding us, but the accuracy didn't really matter. And we're not even questioning that. So, so, so this fight that we are having over accuracy is, is not, not helpful. We gotta fight differently. Now, Let's uh, switch gears and, and talk a little bit about my personal background. I, I got trained as a water engineer, and I got increasingly, increasingly interested in complex systems, in the social dimension, economic dimensions of water management, understanding that um, we we're dealing with a lot of trade-offs, uncertainty, bounded rationality, even non-stationarity in these systems. It's really hard to understand these systems. And at some point, because of my interest in policy and talking about how the politicians should act and, and behave and change the, 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 the processes and rules and regulations and markets and so on, um, you know, I, I was unlucky or lucky or I don't know. I, got, I was invited to go back home after so many years and say, serve as a deputy head of Iran's Department of Environment, deputy vice president of Iran, and, 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 and help with, with, with solving the problem. Um, when I went to the real world, I realized that water is just a very small component, a tiny dot on the, the, the you know, in, in the complex human nature system that, that we're dealing with. Um, so it's, it's much smaller than I, I thought. It was my world, but it, it became a very small thing when I, I was in practice. Of course, you know, when uh, people like myself do research, you think about complexity, you, you touch water, you want to get into water management, you think about food production, agriculture, environment, the energy system, and so on. But that's not even enough. Water, food, energy nexus is not going to explain all the problems we need to deal with. Um, because the politicians need to also deal with a lot of other problems, economy, defense, um, foreign, you know, um, foreign politics, uh, international relations, the infrastructure system, housing, um, and health, uh, right? So public health. So, so when you have to deal with these problems, then, then it's, it's, it's really impossible because you, you touch one of them and then something else goes wrong in another part of the system. We saw this in COVID-19. The consensus among the, the scientists was that shut down, stay at home, social distancing can, can solve, you know, at least uh, prevent from you know, more people dying, and it was correct. But then we had 
heads of states resisting, presidents and prime ministers resisting against that. Not that they wanted people to die, but because they also had a you know, macro level understanding of the system that if you shut this system down, then the economy would get hurt and the people you're trying to save would suffer economically. And we are seeing the consequences right now around the world. So, so then how do I deal with this problem? Complexity science, system science indeed tells us something very disappointing, and that is that, that these problems have no solution. Complex problems have no solutions. There is no way you can completely solve the, these problems. Health-related problems, water-related problems, climate-related problems, environmental problems, energy problems, resource management problems, all of these are complex. E economy, like how do, you, how do I deal with the interest rate? Shall I raise it? You know, what's going to happen to the housing market? What's going to happen to people's mortgages? We don't have the answer to these questions because these are complex problems. We, we fix something and something else would, would, would get damaged. So complexity science tells us that what we need to focus on is navigation through complexity and creating the least damages going forward and downward. Now, in this type of problem solving, we have to make sure that by solving one problem, we're not creating new problems. If you're, extra, I don't know, interested in electric cars, good, we, it helps our, our pollution to an extent, the emission to an extent, but if it's, it's hurting people in, in, in Bolivia, you know, and, and the mining is, is killing people and giving them cancer, we got to think about what we are doing and, and what the consequences are for the rest of the world. Otherwise, we are not. We are changing one game with another game, and we are, you know, we have hurt already some people and some part of the planet, and now we are switching to another location. Now, one of the very first papers I wrote after coming back into science um, from politics was, okay, what was my understanding of how people? how policymakers set the agenda because they're dealing with these problems, they're continuously dealing with these problems, and they're continue to deal you know, with these problems forever, as long as humans exist. But then you have limited resources, limited time to operate, and, and, and limited time in office. How do you pr prioritize the problems? Which problem do you deal with first? And you know, I, I, I modified a little bit the, the famous Eisenhower um, box that you know President Eisenhower is believed to. You know, he was using this for prioritizing his daily tasks. But it's it's indeed the way we we, we operate in, in public policy setting. We only deal with we have the bandwidth to only deal really with with the problems with, which are both relatively urgent and relatively important. The, you know, the society determines what is relatively important and where, where, what is relatively urgent. And, in, you know, I come from the Middle East. Water is, is, is problematic there. People appreciate that, the, the significance of the problem. But at the same time, people are doing, all, you know, they have so many other, other problems. Um, in the last so many weeks, um, the Iranians have been out on the street and protesting and fighting for, for some simple things that we, you know, we're blessed with. We were not even thinking about uh, here. Of course, during this time, the society has not had the chance of thinking about some problems of tomorrow, the next generations, because they're getting shot at, like you're you know, going out in the street right now. So the, the survival, the future won't matter. So, and, and then the, the policymakers, of course, are not taking action on the environment or water or, or climate change and so on, because the system understands that this is an urgent problem. But let's say this didn't exist like what we saw in, in summer in, in Germany. Water all of a sudden became an important thing and more, relatively more important and relatively more urgent because when you see the Rhine is dry, then you start talking about it. The society appreciates that this is a serious issue that we need to deal with. The farmers are getting hurt and so on. So unfortunately, for a lot of these problems, we need to have some sort of a catastrophe or extreme event so they become important only after a flood. Or, you know, we, we had it recently in Germany, and only after a, a drought, we talk about these problems. There is a window of opportunity, and then the next problem kicks in, and we get distracted and go to another one. Now, environment is the same thing. Although it's a, prob it's a serious problem, but it's not the most urgent thing in the minds of people. Uh, compared to other things. If I have housing issues and employment issues and so many other things, I, environment is not my top priority. Climate change, because we have pushed so much forward, we are doing all these campaigns, we're, we're doing, you know, the me media is at our, at our disposal and we're spending a lot of money on. 
some some societies they, they even think that you know climate change is kind of climate change is a different environmental problem. It's not as bad as is is much worse than deforestation, or much worse than pollution, and much worse than some other things. I don't think that's that must be the case. But but still, compared to other things, it's not the most urgent problem compared to to COVID-19. COVID-19 was not an urgent thing at the beginning. The Chinese were dying. It was not an urgent in the problem in the United States. The Iranians started dying. It was a, a, a global South problem. Then the Italians got hit. Still, the Americans were denying it. It's a flu. And then the Americans started getting hit. The problem was, was different. The attitude changed. And then one country after another, failure, failure, failure. But it, it, the, the, the impact of it was visible. It was killing people. It was killing our, our loved ones. I lost a grandfather to COVID-19. So, so the sense, my feeling is, 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 is different when I see the, you know, these problems when the events are visible. That is why, actually, we, we in, you know, in science or in, environment, in environmentalism, we kind of climatize every event. So there, there's a wildfire somewhere, flood somewhere, we immediately blame it on climate change. And that is not true all, 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 all the time. But it's a way that people are using to, to create this sense of urgency. Now, we, we have the activists, we have a concerned generation. That is amazing. It's needed because you want to elevate the sense of urgency and sense of importance of the problem um, in the society. You want to push and, and put pressure on the politicians to take action. You want everyone to take action. But, but activism is not enough to get us out. You, you can chant and you can attack and, and, and give, I don't know, different very ambitious speeches, but it's not gonna solve the problem. We still need a pathway. And as a person who spent in time, time in politics, also understand that in politics, we, 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 do, we make a lot of ambitious speeches and, and we sign a lot of you know, big agreements and, and shake a lot of hands, but still we're not necessarily thinking about the pathway to change. And unless we have the solutions handy, unless we have the scientists and, and engineers providing us with solutions, we just chit chat and talk and talk. And that is what we are seeing. If you look at the latest emissions gap report, we are seeing that countries have not delivered on their, on their promises. And I say that as a person who shook a lot of hands, as a person who led a, a delegation to climate change negotiations. Uh, and, and, and when I was behind the podium, I had to think about, at the same time that I'm thinking about the globe, I had to think about my nation. Uh, I had to think about what, what, is, what is fair and unfair about this game. What is my problem that is not being you know, um, considered here in this, this negotiation, these negotiations? And you know, I'm, I'm looking at the German chancellor in Bonn and, and she's not promising to shut down the coal, uh, coal power plants. Then why should I promise to shut down the oil uh, industry on behalf of a country which relies on, on oil? then the politicians become selfish when they are in these, these things because national interests and self-interest and all those things become a, a driving force of, of the negotiations. And these are real. We're not gonna shake hands and forget that, that political boundaries exist. Un, un, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, these things exist and, and in politics, they, they can block the ways. And, and I remember, at least I can quote myself that in, in Bonn in 2017, this was my concern that you know, how about the pathway? What is the, what is the solution? Yes, transfer of technology, transfer of know-how fund, funding, but it's just, this is not happening. And this is what, what we need. We need cheap solutions provided by you, the engineers and scientists who, who you know, who can really materialize what, what help us materialize what we are promising as, as politicians, or they, they promise as, as, as politicians. But in, in the game, we also want to make this game a, a fair game. It's a it's just game. So we got to think about what are the other countries' problems are. In, in Europe, energy and security is an issue. And you have all the incentives to develop solar panels and, and wind turbines. But other countries might have other problems. And if you want them to also be with you, make sure that the climate change narrative that you're building and selling and promoting also connects to their problem. 
They might be concerned about water. They might be concerned about air pollution, about some of the things that you are not concerned about. And, and unless you talk about those, they're not going to get connected. They don't think this is a global game. They, don't, this, they think this is the game of the, you know, the, the, the problem of the whites, the people who are so, so relieved with their future that they have a chance to think, with their today, that they have a chance to think about the future. Now, if, now, but, but remember that solving and addressing complex problems needs solving, um, solving, um, solving complicated problems. Now, there is a distinction between complex and complicated here, and, and I want to leave it, you know, this should be, if, in case you didn't know, I, I think this can be a take-home message uh, today. Complex problems, as I told you, cannot be solved. They have, we have to address them, we have to face them, they would be with us forever. We solve one, we, we jump to another one, and so on. But there are complicated problems that we need to deal with, and engineers are good at solving complicated problems. We can put our brains together and tackle big problems. We, we invest in those time, science, and so on, and we solve them. Now, if you, the, the latest pandemic, the problem we had, the pandemic, the, the management of the COVID-19 crisis was a complex problem. But finding the vaccine as the solution was a complicated problem. We eventually managed to produce a vaccine. That's you know, a complicated problem. But the complex problem was still unresolved. And we, even now, we cannot go back in time and say, these sequence of events or actions could have been the best strategy for all nations to save them from this. The latest reports, one, um, the, the Green Recovery Report that I led uh, as the author, and it would be released next month in New York, and then the Emissions Gap Report, come, which came last week, came out last week, are, are telling us something promising, very relevant to what you're doing, your university is doing here, uh, that there are these sectors, you know, five, five sectors, and that are the priority areas for investment, if you want to fight with climate change, if you want to deliver on, 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 on the SDGs, and if you want to recover better than before and build a real future that we want and, and see how you're connected, your science, your work is connected to, to these sectors. I bet, I assume all of you are connected to these, these groups of, of these areas sense. And that is, that is something promising. And they're indeed, they're all connected to climate change. They're all connected to the SDGs. And, and now, this is, there is a chance for us to enable the future by solving these complicated problems and help the politicians and societies address the complex problems. Now, this is a difference with, with, with previous rounds of talking and, and talking and talking. We are now recognizing that the involvement of the private sector is extremely important. And unless we have uh, them with us in this game, we will fail and we cannot deliver on what we are think. So the era of asking the big guys, uh, you know, and, and big gals, uh, big, the, the politicians to solve our problems and waiting for them to take action is, is over. We now understand that there are many other issues and barriers to, to, to a real change and a pathway to change. So the involvement of, of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and, and Amazons and giants, uh, tech, tech giants and so on, and startups that the spin-offs that come out of your, your universities are needed. And, and that is what we are seeing, a new gold rush, at least, that might be, in the ESG market and, and, and in the numbers that are are growing because our generation, next generations, are, are, are really interested in, in solving these problems. But I also want to end my conversation with this because now we're go going to hear about something very exciting, climate-informed engineering. The data is out there. We have collected all this information. It's, it's everywhere, and we are more powerful when we, it comes to collecting data. But data by itself you know, the ability to compute and collecting data and running AIs and, and different algorithms and machine learning al algorithms doesn't mean that we understand better. That's something we gotta work on because the process of turning data into wisdom is a complicated process and might be even complex process. And unless we take action on that and we spend time and resources as you, you know, the, your university is going to do, um, we cannot really generate the wisdom we need. And if we don't do that, 
conspiracy theories would win and, and, and are the fools who, who win, win this battle. So that is why we, we need things all like climate informed engineering and, and that is why I like to remind us that our power when it comes to solving problem um, you know, can be much greater than the, the uh, sum of, our, of the parts, which is us. The same is true about problems that we are dealing with. They're, they're much bigger than the sum of their parts. But, but Germany has, has done big things in the past and, and has been a role model for the world. So I hope, um, you know, in, in the, I wish you success uh, in this new program that I'm also a founding member of. Um, and the world is also watching you in, in the, well, the energy crisis problem. So prove that, that a change is possible and, and sustainable, sustainability is an achievable target. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Madani, for this uh, very exciting talk. I think a lot of to think. I understood the difference between the complex and complicated problem. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's something concrete as well. So thanks a lot. And uh, now we go on. We will have a chance to ask questions to Professor Madani in the panel discussion. But now we have two more uh, small uh, short inputs and one on the uh, introduction of the climate informed engineering, which is going to be given by Professor Shokri. Please, Nima. Thank you very much. Let me just test this one. Yep. Perfect. So now it's very difficult to give a presentation after the excellent and thought-provoking presentation by Professor Madani. But I'm going to give it a try. And the good news is I talk only for five minutes, so I think I can survive. So I'm going to use this, uh, talk, this time, this talk, to shortly discuss about, explain uh, the, the new research initiative uh, established at Hamburg University of Technology in uh, collaboration with uh, Max Planck Institute for Meteorology and United Nations University called Climate Informed Engineering. So I'm, I'm going to just say a few words about the, the idea behind, the concept behind Climate Informed Engineering. To be honest, the, the, the concept to me is not new. Climate informed engineering, over the course of history, humans have been always using climate knowledge, climate information to develop their businesses, to grow their community, to, to build infrastructure, to manage their food production. And, and, uh, and, uh, but what is new here is that that we are living in a world uh, that we are observing the birth of a new generation, new class of the uh, climate models. Thanks to the uh, efforts of scientists like Professor Biron Stevens, who is in the audience, that they are talking about a new class of climate models that are capable of uh, simulating, basically, the, uh, describing, basically, how our planet may respond to the ongoing climate change with a very high spatial and temporal resolution. Biron is here, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're talking about the resolution of one kilometer resolution and the temporal resolution of like within a few minutes. And to me, that provides an excellent opportunity for the engineers. To me, engineers must seize this moment and fully embrace this opportunity provided by this massive uh, climate informatics to, uh, in basically in their engineering products and, and uh, services. So. The idea basically is, so let's say they have this uh, climate, these sophisticated climate models with all this data and information, so that will be fed into this uh, new emerging interdisciplinary field of climate informed engineering. And, and, and uh, if I want to give an example, for example, uh, imagine, suppose if I tell you 50 years from now, uh, you will have significantly more, let's say, precipitation in Hamburg, or you will have much more frequent, let's say, heat waves in Hamburg, or sea level rise. So does this information, does this information affect the way you design, let's say, your buildings, the way you design your road, the way you manage Altus land, the apple orchard, does it, is it useful or not? And if it is useful, welcome on board. So you can be a part of the climate informed uh, engineering. And I believe 
this uh, will have contribution to topics such as green transition or uh, developing novel materials and processes or technology utilizing technology for 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 uh, sustainability and of course this will affect many processes including the un sustainable uh, the, the 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 un sustainable uh, development goals and i actually listed a couple of them here but if i wanted to pick up i don't know one of them let's let's look into the reduced inequalities so i believe a climate-informed engineer will be able to uh, develop and construct more resilient products to basically protect uh, human uh, and, and their businesses in difficult times against the, the extreme climate event, let's say flooding, let's say sea level rise, and so on. And that will contribute, and that will contribute to reducing the inequalities and to topics such as climate justice, which uh, cover uh, discussed a bit about. So, so, uh, so, foundation of this, uh, this uh, research initiative at TU Hamburg, I believe it will enable us to capitalize on our uh, strengths in engineering, in, in technology, and, uh, and, 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 and this will enable us to, to train a new generation of the engineers who, who are basically, uh, who will be basically able to serve at the forefront of the uh, global effort to fight the climate change. And within this context, we have two, uh, at least at the moment, in my opinion, we have two uh, goals in this research initiative. The first one is to basically uh, integrating the basic climate science and information in our engineering education. And the second one is to provide a platform where, uh, where engineers, uh, climate scientists, uh, politicians, and people from industry and public can exchange tools, ideas, and, and, and skills. And this paper, uh, in fact, it was published last night, uh, just one day before the event, that is, um, uh, I, wrote, uh, I and together with the other founding members of this uh, research initiative, that is uh, professors Bjorn Stevens, Kave Madani, Jorgen Grabe, Michael Schluter, and Irina Smirnova, where we discussed uh, more detail about climate-informed engineering and what do we mean by that and how we envision uh, its uh, development. So if you're interested, please do feel free to look for the paper. It's an open access paper. Paper. And, uh, and by that, uh, I would like to uh, conclude my talk by, uh, by acknowledgement. Of course, uh, I had the privilege of uh, uh, talking, having many meetings and discussion with colleagues, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and especially the founding members of this research initiative, which I highly appreciate. And also, I would like to acknowledge the significant contribution of the members of the Institute of Geohydroinformatics, who uh, basically helped us not only to develop the idea, but also enabled us to, or enabled me to implement uh, uh, this uh, idea. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. So now we have heard uh, what happens in the big world. We have heard what happens at TUHH. And now we are uh, glad to, to change again the scale. And uh, we have uh, uh, today Dr. Heiko Knopp, who is the deputy co-leader of the Green, uh, uh, Green Party. And he would comment this uh, topic today, can human adapt to climate change? from his view, and I think he has now a tough job because the politicians <laughs> were mentioned today very many times, so I'm looking forward how you can address mm. it, and we believe that you can tackle this challenge as well. Please, go ahead. So, I, <laughs> so thank you very much for having me here. Um, so I'm very happy to speak here today uh, because on one hand, I'm an engineer. I have worked uh, at the Fraunhofer Institute uh, uh, of Optics and, and uh, Mechanics in Jena for uh, eight years in advanced research. And on the other hand, I'm a politician, so I was already mentioned before. And um, so um, I want to give some reflections on the topic already explained. And. Um, yeah, I'm honored to speak here at these um, unconventional times. Uh, we have to force multiple tasks in parallel, actually. 
the climate crisis, which in recent years has shaken us even faster, even more intensely and even more threateningly. And actually we have to force, of course, as well, the economic problems with this massive price increases driven by oil and gas. We have to force this insane war uh, in the EU um, with the aggression by Russia on the Ukraine. And all of these problems need our attention, need political action, and of course also a social adaptation. And so we have virulent times and we'll have to give complexes of answers to these complex questions uh, and to these multiple tasks. And of course, this climate crisis might be just one part of these problems, but nevertheless, it's the man-made climate crisis, it's the biggest and the overwhelming problem showing its consequences worldwide. Most recently with the brutal floods in, in Pakistan, with the record road that has been going on for years in East Africa, for, where 30 millions of people are at the risk of famine. And for the future, Climate models show us that the newly planted trees in inner cities today have little chances of surviving because they will become even drier, it will become even hotter and even more hostile to live. And on the other hand, the IPCC report from this year have clearly shown our destructive course, more than three degrees uh, of Celsius of overheating of our Earth uh, are at the end of this path, pave, uh, this path paved with fossil energies. And this graphic shows this tremendous importance of an ambitionated climate action. But as an engineer on the other side, this third IPCC partial report has given me one hope on the technical point, because on the first time it has been proven that our technical technology is sufficient. We demonstrably have all the techni technical uh, requisites in the hand to achieve the path of the climate goal of, 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 uh, of uh, Paris. Uh, so we need concrete actions. And this is a political, a social, and also, of course, a technical path and the technical tasks, but uh, we have, uh, all we have to do is to finally put all these things in good use. And here now, triggered by Russia's uh, war of aggression, we see a paradigm change in the public perception. So a sentence that would have been a provocation for many years ago, now sounds very self-evident. With renewable energies, we're ensuring climate protection and the security of our power in equal measure. So we have to face both problems in parallel. We have to keep the actual system as our basis of our society vital and dynamic, saving the security of the power supply. And in parallel, we have to bring up the change for the complete energy system to renewables. And actually, the level of the dynamics in the renewable energy systems is increased drastically. If I'm speaking with investors in Germany, they tell me that they want to invest in wind and in, in solar even more than just one year ago. So, um, Yes, I am convinced humans can adapt to the climate change. Humans can do um, a lot of things and have huge chances with their creativity, with their knowledge and their curiosity. And human can, humans can influence their surrounding, adapting to new circumstances and have the sensitivity to feel and to see also the natural boundaries. So this adaption, this change in technical, in social, and economical behavior needs help from all sides of the chessboard. Um, it needs the cooperation of sufficient political guidelines. It needs open-minded, modern, and motivated scientists. And it needs engineers. And it needs 
economic priority for the green and sustainable investments. But okay, let's not kid ourselves. These are very big problems. These are very big tasks ahead of us that will be very difficult to solve. And for example, the shortage of skilled workers is a really big problem. So we are committed to a modern strategy for skilled workers so that the people in the offices as well as the craftsmen or the installers can be quickly found and enabled in the skills that are urgent needed for the transition. But that will be one of the biggest challenges, especially here in Germany, and that will demand a lot of us. And we'll need to work on the climate problem in the bigger picture. Of course, we'll need research and development for the planting and new techni techniques, but we'll also need adaption for the foreseen problems with drought and flooding. We'll need new ideas in the designing of social areas or in respect on healthcare systems and agriculture. The transformation of the chemical industry and the processes to green uh, hydrogen techniques, to optimization of our houses, to save energy uh, used for the heating, to provide modern climate friend, uh, friendly mobility, transportation and circular economy. These are all big tasks. And we need more information, more ex uh, information exchange and knowledge transfer. Knowledge transfer all over the world. We need open crossable borders for ideas as well as for people, and we need interdisciplinary cooperation between the different scientific areas, and we need the best access to education and progress worldwide. And of course, so, of course, these are big tasks for policies, for foreign policy, as well as for industrial specification law, for the global perspectives of standardization, for the support of inventors and entrepreneurs. But yes, the challenges are huge. The political obstacles are great. The time is pressing. That sounds for me as a normal task for engineers. Yeah, so my, my um, background says me every, everyone has its own problems and brings these problems to a project and then the engineer has to solve it. And of course, that's, that's not a call from my side to postpone the problem, yeah? We have to solve this now. Of course, there will be ideas and investigations further on, but we have to start now. We have to start now and of course we have to be more radical than before. But, yes, um, it will need people who talk about the problem, who think about these, uh, who discuss about, and it needs also people to get down to the work, to change, and who break new ground. That's why I'm particularly pleased that this is new initiative has been launched, and therefore I want to congratulate you to this new project and the corresponding aims. I'm very hopeful I'm very happy and I'm, uh, yeah, I'm very glad that I was uh, introduced to this, uh, to this joint meeting and I'm open to, for your questions now. Thank you.